the Honorable Holy Spirit will be present here. Thank you. Uh, wow. Um, Teresa had to come back and cue us, you know, in the pre-service prayer. She had to cue us that she's not going to cue us because for the last couple months, when there's transition, she's cueing us. It's like, okay, you guys be quiet and we'll run the video clip. Okay, five, four. And she's like, I, I'm not going to cue you today. It's like, oh, no. It's like a big transition. It's great to have you here. It's great to see you here. For all of you who didn't come, you are still just as much a welcome part of our worship service. But I want to encourage you, um, man, we are in a, a storm. You know, I mean, first, all the fear of COVID-19. Um, and I mean, it's swept across the world. The few times I've left the Twin Cities and gone someplace else, you drive into a different atmosphere of fear. And every, every place is different. I was sitting outside of a Menards in, a, in another city uh, about a week and a half ago, and this guy was so frustrated, and I just rolled in the window and started talking to him, and he's like, you know, he goes, I came last night, he goes, I have my 12-year-old and my 16-year-old, and they kicked us out, you know, and it said no children, but it didn't give an age limit. And in and, and another situation, somebody passed out at their shopping cart, and they shut the store down. And, um, you know, they, they wouldn't let it reopen until it, it, everything was disinfected. And there's just, there's a fear, there's a panic, there's misinformation. Um, and then we have what's happened here, you know, in, in our own Twin Cities that has sparked anger and rioting. And it is a tragedy, it's a murder, um, and it, it's going to be dealt with. But what it has sparked, all right, what is it is ignited is not peace. And so we have these two, these two great offenses warring in our nation and in our city. And God has called the church to stand up. He's called you to come together and pray. All right? Pray for justice. Pray for peace. But also pray for truth. Because like we said in pre-service prayer, these spiritual battles are never power struggles. They're truth encounters. All right? And, and when people begin to partner with lies, there is fear. But what removes the fear is truth. And the author of all truth, we're here to worship this morning, and his name is Jesus. Thank you for one person being excited about that. I pray that many of you at home, where you are, also stand with us as we begin to worship and proclaim and declare the name of Jesus into every one of these situations. Because that's the answer. So let's stand and worship together on open in prayer. God, I thank you. The Lord, you had a plan from day one. You had a plan before you even created us. The Lord, you had a redemption plan before you even launched uh, the earth 1.0. <laughs> And God, that plan has, has come to being. You sent your son to take all of this pain, all this shame, all this hurt, all this injustice upon him to the cross. But now, Lord, I pray you would release it to all those that are hurting, God. Release it into the cities. Release it, God, Lord, into a people group that need to, be, to feel accepted and feel the oneness that you created at the cross. And Lord, help us to examine our hearts. So, Lord, we can be a part of the healing process. We can be a part of the justice process. But, God, for all of the lies, Lord, I pray as we declare the name of Jesus that truth just wipes them from the skies and the light of life and the hope of Jesus penetrate the dark clouds that have been hovering over our nation. It's time for the church to arise and it's time for the power of Jesus to be proclaimed in our city and in our nation and in our world. So Lord, we lift you up this morning, God. We honor you, glorify you, and we say in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
trust in you today, God. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. Like weakness is a canvas for your strength and My story isn't over My story's just begun Failure won't divide me Cause that's what my father does Failure won't divide me Cause that's what my father does Welcome anymore. 
of joy. God, we believe that you move the mountains, that you meet us in the valley, that we will not be overcome.
cries out. It's like, we don't need any more words. We need a move of God. And that's made available by the price that he paid. The fact that he carried everything, everything to the cross. All of our hurts, our shame, all the pain. Did God know? Absolutely he knew. And so he sent his son and willingly allowed his body to be broken crushed, destroyed, the cruelest form of death for our pain. So God, we just thank you as we take, we take this bread and we break it. We do it in remembrance of you. Every time we meet God, realizing that this is our source, this is our life. No man has a, an answer, a remedy, but the man, the sinless one who came and died. So we thank you now. We pray for healing. 
the healing that was made possible by your broken body. Lord, that by your stripes, healing is released, God. It's that healing we'll call upon for the sick. It's that healing we call upon to eradicate COVID-19. It's that healing we call upon to heal a nation. We do this, God, in remembrance of you knowing that you, you are that lamb. You are that sacrifice. You are the Savior. Let's partake together in Jesus' name. And after the same manner, if I can get it open, he took the cup. I'm working on it. Try not to spill. These are our new COVID-19 cups. Right. This do we for you. We do this for you, but, but we also do it for him. There we go. So, God, I just thank you. <laughs> Lord, as in ancient days past, blood of an innocent lamb had to be shed for the sins of a family, the sins of a nation. You became the lamb whose blood was shed for the sins of a world. And, God, we see on display more than we even want to the sins of the world. So we call upon the one thing, God, the one thing that washes away the stain of that sin, that can separate it as far as the east is from the west and can cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, God. God, we have been accused of just wanting quiet again. But no, God, we want peace. We want peace and quiet. It was paid for by this blood. Lord, I just pray you just pour it out freely as you did on that cross upon every person, every hurting one, every confused one, every lost one. Reach out to them by the power of this blood with the saving grace that only it has. We do this in remembrance of you because our hope and our life is in you. Our peace is in you and we thank you for the greatest sacrifice of all. You died in our place. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Stand with, with us again and let's just worship and thank God for his sacrifice and call upon him for his healing. In Jesus' name. In the crushing pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to into your careful hand when I trust you I don't need to understand so make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing.
church that you've called us to be. Amen? Yeah. We're in the part of the service of declarations. So if you would join with me in today's new declarations, I believe the way I love people is a direct reflection of my love for God. I value and honor others even when we disagree. I am adopted into God's family. And because of the Father's love and wisdom, I can build a healthy family and community. Forgiveness is my standard, and I will give everyone the opportunity to rebuild trust in the community. Come on, Agret. God. Thank you, Jesus. I, I just having such a good time in worship, you know. Uh, why don't you just tell that guy he doesn't need to preach. We're just going to keep worshiping. Glory to God. Cut that out. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we have a couple other items of business. First of all, it is great to see you all spread out across the balcony and the... Uh, you know, the main auditorium, we have a COVID cluster just for you with your name on it. And there's plenty of room left. So next week, if you stayed home for others, it's okay. It's your turn. You, you can come. We got room for you. We have some new members. I, I, I'm going to announce them. There'll be a slide for them later. Uh, this young man um, has just recently come up. Oh, I know, Sheldon Mathena. Are you familiar with him? Right, right. And then June, if you just wave, right there, look at there, June. And then we have another family, a couple who have just marinated in this community and in the presence of God, and, and they just felt it was time to come out of that oven, and, and, and uh, it's the Candace and John Michael Diamond. John Michael's up there, and so thank you. We also, if you look around, things have changed here, and... Um, you know, it's changes we've contemplated for quite some time. We had a mold issue in the ceiling, uh, a pretty big section of the ceiling. I had tried to remedy it a few times, and um, it was like putting lipstick on a pig. And we knew we needed to move everything out of the way, throw it on tarps, scrape everything off, and really get to the issue. And so when this COVID-19 hit, we're like, you know, I, can't, I don't think there's a better time. And so uh, some people uh, came in, and I just want to thank you um, for putting in long hours and helping us to do all that we needed to do. Um, I'm joking. I will probably always continue to look up at that ceiling because at one point, after a couple 80-hour weeks, I came in on a Saturday morning, and I was putting the lift up there, and I needed to just go a little higher. And I put the lift through the ceiling. So I can guarantee you there's not a water problem up there because... I looked on the other side. So, uh, and, and if you're in the foyer and you see an indent in the wall, just don't say anything about it. Just, you know, it was a really bad day. <laughs> I went to move the lift out there, and it's a joystick, and, and I moved it, and I stopped the joystick, and the lift still moved, and crunch. 
It's like, so I began the day with the roof and I, or the ceiling, and I ended the day with a wall. So don't ask me to drive your lift. That is the lesson for today. But I want to thank uh, the Schleys. Uh, John, uh, uh, help with the ceiling. Amen. He built his own box seating for the service, as you can see. Now, the Schley family have box seating, but it is for the, the really especially helps us out with live stream. Um, in the foyer, uh, uh, some of the decorative work is theirs. And, and uh, we also want to thank pa- Pastor Kim. She's put in um, a lot of long hours, not just in helping us with this, but last weekend while you were away, and the reason we postponed a week is that we hosted Lamb, uh, Love After Marriage. The leaders of Lamb, this was going to be the last time they offered it. So it was, you know, have it or maybe not be able to even have it for several years. Uh, Kim hosted it. She had to put all the food in individually wrapped bags and go around and follow people and spray and clean. And she did an incredible job. And so, Kim, thank you for, for, yeah. Also, and he's supposed to be watching today, so I want to thank Dewey. Uh, Dwayne is... uh, is the representative of Carpet City, and they're the ones that work with us and got, got the pink out. And so um, thank you to them and their crew and the timeliness of how everything came together. And I'm going to just take a moment. Um, we are, I'm going to pray um, for the offering, but what we're going to ask you to do is just give as you go out. Uh, if you're watching today, uh, there's three options. You can mail us. Uh, you can uh, go to uh, PushPay. And you'll see that on the slide. And third, you can um, uh, go to our website. But we have raised about a little over 11,000 of the 18 that we needed to do the facelifts we're doing. As you can see, most of it's done. The bills are going to be coming in. So we really hope so is the money. So above and beyond your tithe, if you can help us in that way, just put on uh, other, uh, the building. And, and, uh, and there's, there's other things. When you do a remodel, I mean, how many realize that as you get into it, there's always more? So there are some things that we want to do, um, but we're waiting to pay for what we did do. So if you could help us, we appreciate that. Um, So we have really, I think it's a dedication. So as I pray for the offering and we go to the announcements, I I just also want to just pray that that we rededicate the space that God has given us and... um, you know, I, I'm just so thankful. We, had, we didn't know what COVID-19 guidelines, CDC rules, uh, what our governor was going to expect from us. So to do this and then to be able to actually set up in a way that fits the guidelines, it's just, it's just an added blessing. So God, I just thank you. Lord, this is just the barn. But God, we need to be good stewards of the barn. Because what you died for is the grain, the fruit, the people, the souls that come in. So, God, I just thank you for the faithfulness of these, this congregation. God, going into year 77 um, in this location since 85. And, God, I just thank you um, for their stewardship. And I pray you would bless each one who gives and has given toward this. Lord, that you would just help them. Lord, as they help the house of the Lord, that you'd help them with their house. Lord, that you would heap your blessings upon them. Lord, we dedicate this place to the presence of God, to the healing of the land. And Lord, as a place where the harvest does come in. So Lord, the barn is ready. And I pray you would raise up your church now, God, to be laborers in the fields because they are white unto harvest. So we give you glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. I've become accustomed to more, but that's okay. Let's get more from God today, amen? 
So we have been going through our core values, and that's what our sermon series has been. And it's, man, it's just really different to see people in the chairs, you know? Uh, but it's good. It's really good. But as you walked in, you saw a banner, hopefully overhanging the, the doorway. If you didn't, take a look at it on your way out. Um, it breaks down our core values into the four sections. But we're going through the core values of the church. And remember, what, what is the first core value? Anyone? Okay, that's it. Everybody take out a three by five card, and we're going to have a quiz. No, the first core value is that God is good, all right? And it is the foundation that we build everything upon. And even in the midst of the storms that we have in our country today, we have to build on the foundation that God is good, amen? That is where hope comes from. And in that New Wine song, and by the way, I uh, just thank you, worship team, the, the worship order, the songs, I just, I love it when the Holy Spirit just weaves things together. But we, we ended up with that New Wine song, and I'm like, you know, when you end up in a crisis situation, you get squeezed, but what comes out of you is what's already in there. Okay? So, I mean, if anger comes out, anger was, if fear comes out, fear was in it, but hopefully if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you get squeezed, a new wine comes out of you, the love and the peace of Jesus, and that's what's needed in this place. So here where we're at, Pastor Lisa did a great job in speaking on the family, and um, we, we even... Our declaration really, really picks up on that core value. But today's is God is still speaking. And you know, when I came to this core value, I'm like, wow, we did the whole Hearing the Voice of God series. We did the Hearing the Voice of God class. We had Brian Fenimore in, and he did the teaching on the prophetic on Sunday evenings. And so it's like, oh. And so I, I poured my heart into this, and, and, and bear with me, because we're going all the way back to the beginning of the book. Genesis 3. Uh, 8 through 4, 1, and I want to read it to you and then pray, but it's like God is still speaking. Well, one of the things I think we need to do in a world today that has stopped believing in God and forgotten to call upon him is remind them that God speaks to his people. Amen? Amen. Okay. When the cool of the evening breezes are blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called out to man and said, where are you? And I just got to tell you right now, I believe that God is calling out to the church saying, where are you? Adam replied, I, hear, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Hmm. Who told you you were naked, the Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, well, it was the woman who gave me, uh, uh, who, who, it, was, it was the woman who gave me, who, who, she gave me that fruit, and I ate it. You know, I didn't, I purposely, I wasn't going to, but I'm going to. Uh, I didn't put it in the notes, but I thought it every time I got here. Men, God gave you a mantle of authority, and you need to wear it. And with that mantle comes times where the spirit in you may not agree with the person with you. And you have to have the courage to go with the Spirit in you lovingly over the person with you, or it's not the person with you's fault. It's your fault that you didn't listen to the Spirit within you. Are you following me? I'm trying to say it as nicely as I can. Amen. You have to follow the Holy Spirit first, all right? And we're going to get to this. Um, this was the first test of man. It was a pass-fail. There's no grading on a curve. And it was a group project. And they both failed. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? She said, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. And is it true? Absolutely. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly. And he's talking about to the serpent. I just said to clarify that because I missed a line. Man, I man, I thought I was saying God said that to the woman. No. Then the Lord said this to the serpent, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between the offspring and her, her offspring, and you will, stri you will strike, your, uh, he will strike your head and, and you will strike his heel. Then he said this to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. Oh, man. It's all women on the face of the earth right now. Let's just together, just you guys forgive Eve. Right now, just forgive Eve, just let it go. You will desire to control your husband. I'm going to keep moving. This, I'm just reading the scripture, no hate here. But he will rule over you. 
And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate of the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. And every time I came back from pheasant hunt and had to sit with my dog for hours and pick all those burrs and thistles, and you know, or he'd stop hunting, whining, and I'm like, come on, come on, come on, Bo, go, go. And there'd be one stuck right between his, it was like, hey, Adam, way to go. Way to go, dude. Messing with my hunting dog. But by the sweat of the brow, you will have food to eat until you have returned, you've, it is returned to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Now, that, my friends, is what I would call paradise lost. Right? It says, then man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who lived. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it, then they will live forever. So the Lord, God, banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground which, had been, which he had came from. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim, angels, to the east of the garden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. God walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the evening, and he talked with Adam and Eve. We all know how that ended. God, show us today that you created us to be in fellowship, in communion with you. You created us so that you could be a loving father to a family, that you could nurture us, that you could care for us. You created us and initially put us in paradise, God. But it would not be honor, it would not be fellowship, it would not be love if there wasn't a choice. And so... In that beautiful, perfect, pristine garden, you placed one tree in the center that had no hanging on it. God, help us to learn from the garden that you're speaking to us all the time. We just have to learn to listen all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. See, paradise, God created Adam and Eve to be friends with him. He desired for them to learn to walk in oneness as he and his son and the Holy Spirit walked, as they had done, well, since forever. God created them in a virtual paradise. All animals got along. All fruit and vegetables and grains, they all grew healthy in harmony with each other. Nothing choking out each other, nothing fighting for each other's space. If you don't think it's a big thing, well, then plant your strawberries and your raspberries close to your vegetable garden. You know, your pumpkin patch and cucumbers become terrorists, right? Didn't happen in the Garden of Eden. But I digress. Maybe it's, you know, I'm hungry. Anyway, everything in nature was perfectly in harmony together. You get to have rule and dominion in the garden. And you even got to name the animals. Just do not eat of the fruit. Yes, that's right. One fruit, the fruit of this one tree in the middle of the garden. Why did he put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden anyway? God desires to have relationship with you, relationship with us. You know, you can't have honor if there isn't an opportunity for dishonor. You can't have obedience if there's not an opportunity for disobedience. And so there was the one tree. God desired to have this relationship, this companionship, Specifically, even more, uh, the father to his sons and daughters. He even created us in his own image so that we could bear resemblance of him, which is why we are told in Romans 12, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all that he has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that we find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So how do we interpret that? It's not what you do when you sit in the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in Christ on a Sunday morning that worships him in your body as much as what you do when you're out on your own in the street in the midst of a conflict. The actions you take there are worship to God at a very high volume. So are you responding to all this the way that God has called you to? Are you being God in this situation? So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. It says, don't copy the behavior, the customs of the world, but let God transform you into the new person by changing the way you think. 
Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and the authority that God has given me, I give each of you a warning. Don't think of yourself better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourself by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies are made as parts, each part has a specific function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, but we all belong to each other. My point here is that God designed us from the very beginning to be woven together with him and his son and his spirit in a oneness that is even beyond unity. But it has to come by trust and obedience to the voice of God. And he spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, and each evening he walked with them. But when they took a part of the fruit, which is the knowledge of good and evil, when they heard him, they were afraid. When they heard him, they were ashamed. They didn't know fear or shame before they took of that fruit. So what does that have to do with us? Just as it affected their, uh, how they heard God and how they perceived God, it affects us. See, paradise lost. They ate the one fruit that was forbidden. They lost their innocence of right from wrong, and they began to think independently from God. By the way, this is my interpretation. So do me a favor. Examine it, scrutinize it, go look it up for yourself, pray about it. But first of all, any true relationship is based on trust, Right? If there is not mutual trust, there is a strong, uh, healthy, if there is trust, there's a strong, healthy, vibrant relationship. So God had to give them the trust test. <laughs> this was the first recorded F in history. Has anybody ever gotten an F? Don't raise your hands. Adam and Eve, they failed this test. And no, it doesn't matter who ate the, the, the fruit first. Remember, this is a group project, and they both failed. I remember the first group project I had, I, I, I had more fear. I mean, I, I had such pressure on myself to do well, but all of a sudden, for the first time, what other people did affected my grade. That already messed with me. It's just like I couldn't control what other people were doing and how it affected my outcome. Well, we're in the body of Christ. Get used to it. This is why we love one another. We reach out for one another. We lift each other up because it is a group project called the body of Christ. And we're called to reflect God. So this happened. And, and I would explain that they broke trust. God desires us to put our, our trust in him and not our own understanding. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Don't, you know, don't trust yourself but lean, and lean on your own understanding. Put your trust in God. So they take this fruit, and how, I'm looking at it and go, how do I describe what this is like? Well, quickly, this is what it's like. Your children, before they get to adolescence, don't necessarily have, they don't have the full capacity to, to make decisions for themselves, to think for themselves, to analyze. And then we have these chemicals that come in. We have serotonin, we have melatonin, we have dopamine, all right? And, and when they become an ass, adolescent, dopamine especially gets ramped up in a child's brain. And what is it? It's the pleasure and the desire uh, chemical. So these, but these three together in a teen's mind makes them into a know-it-all. And if you've had teenagers, you know when those three chemicals start to secrete at a higher level because all of a sudden you're stupid, you don't know anything, and they know everything. All right? Anybody experience as a parent? It's okay. You can raise your hand. It's not just you. You're not alone. All right, kumbaya. Let's be together here. It happens. These chemicals begin to discreet. All of a sudden, these, these complicit, these pretty, you know, obedient, compliant children are like, you're stupid, you know? I know everything, and you don't. And you're like, what just happened? You might cast out demons, but it's not going to help. It happens. And, and why do I bring that up? Because all of a sudden, what happened with Adam and Eve is they took that fruit and they became teenagers like that. Before that, they were completely innocent and they trusted in God. God put them in a perfect scenario. All they had to do is obey, trust and obey. For there's no better way to be happy with Jesus but to trust and obey. It's all right. I mean, I grew up on that stuff. But they didn't. They, 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 and, and why? What, what was the serpent's... What he's really saying is, you guys can be like me. Don't you want to be equal to God? 
Don't you want to know the right, you know, this is what's different between you and him, right? He has the knowledge of good and evil. Don't you want to know that? You know, in the garden, the answer really should have been no. Mm -mm. Because once you do, guess what happens? You know, in the Jewish culture, they have a bar mitzvah or a bar mitzvah. And, and part of what they were doing is, at that point, when those chemicals were created and those kids knew it all, the parents were no longer responsible for the actions of their children. Yay, yay. And so they had this great thing, and they put together a minion of 10 or 12 okay, uh, guide, uh, guidance counselors, all right, from family and friends, all of which had passed the age of 29 or 30. They'd all been considered a rabbi. They're old enough now. They don't have to stand or their minion, their guides, their counsel. And, and what happens is the parents pass them off. They're like, you won't listen to us anymore? It's okay. You have to listen to these guys. Good luck. Goodbye. You know, no keys to the car. Whatever. And they did that because this happens. And it was a part of the learning process. Now you are supposed to make a decision with no less than three or four of your minion's opinions. Okay? You need to get your minions' opinions. And if you get your minions' opinions and you do it well, then by the time you get to the age of 29 or 30, then you might actually graduate and become a teacher or a rabbi yourself, and you can become somebody else's minions, and then you can tell them what to do. And this was the process, and it was a brilliant process, and it was important. It was based on what happens biologically and chemically in somebody's life. And, and so where am I going with this? From Adam and Eve, all of us are born into sin. We're born with... Eh, an innate knowledge that wasn't necessarily God's desire, but for good and evil. We need each other. All right? We are each other's minion. We are each other's counsel. God speaks through us, and out of love, you reach out to each other. But ultimately, God speaks to you. All right? And up until that point, they were running on two simple, pure things. Trust and obedience. And those are the two things that give honor to your father. Just in case my kids are listening. Those are the two things that give honor to your father. Trust and obedience. And it was broken. All right? Now, could they hear, still hear from God? Yes, but you see what happens when you break that. Is all of a sudden there's fear. There's shame. There's guilt. There's pain. So Adam and Eve lost their innocence. And really, it was because they didn't value it. Now, you could argue they didn't know how to value it. But either way, they lost it. Second of all, God created us. So, so trust is the foundation, but second is obedience. God uh, created us to adore him as a father. He has turned, uh, <laughs> he in turn adores and he lavishes his love upon us. So it's a two-way street. But how does a child truly honor his father by obeying him? All right, Romans 16, 19 to 20 says, Everyone has heard about your obedience. It's amazing when you go through Scripture and you start looking for the foundational principles of God, the core values. And you find them. I mean, it's like everyone has heard about your obedience. Has everyone heard about your obedience? Is that what you're known for? Everyone, Paul says, has heard about your obedience, so I... I am full of joy over you. Why? They're his disciples. He led them to Christ. He planted them there in the church. And he is such a proud papa because they're known for their obedience. He's full of joy. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. You hear that? I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent of evil. God intended us from the very beginning to be innocent of evil. And they were until they partook of that fruit. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of the Lord Jesus will be with you. He sent his son so that we could reconnect with the Father God, but what he still desires of us has not changed. Trust and obedience. You choosing obedience not only honors God, but it protects you and it keeps you innocent of evil. This is another very important thing to understand about disobedience and God. It has consequences. If you're a mom or dad and, and your mom and dad says to you, don't touch the stove, and you do it, what is the result? You get introduced to pain by getting burned. Sure. 
You can learn from it, but you can also end up getting scarred from it. But if you trust your parents and obey them, you learn from it without the consequences. But trust and obedience go hand in hand. So why are we still in Genesis and the message is about hearing from God today? Well, because you need to understand God is the best father ever and he wants you to be the best children and he wants the best for you, but you have... <laughs> You have to give God your best by listening and obeying. In Jeremiah 29, 11 and 14, we know it. For I know the plans I have for you, God said, to give you a hope and a future. They are plans for good, not disaster. Right? In those days, when you pray, I will listen. So he's listening all the time. He's speaking all the time. We just have to cut out the noise and stop talking ourselves to hear him. He's always speaking. And he has your best in mind. I don't know how good of a GPS you might have on your phone or in your car, but God is better. He's better, right? He's never recomputing. He knows. He's known since the beginning of time where you need to go, how to be the best you you can be. You just have to listen and then trust and obey him. But God, that looks like a dead end. Well, God said, take a left. God doesn't lie. Remember our first core value, God is good. Come on, church. Go back. We're back in the saddle of church again, okay? <laughs> this might be new. Some adjustments have been made. But let's get used to it. Let's, let's do this thing, okay? God is good. Thank you. All the time. Let's, let's add to those two. Let's join them, church. God is good. All the time. You know, I'm sure that it was louder, uh, you know, in the Internet. So James 1, 17 and 18. Whatever is good and perfect comes down from the Father of God, who created all the lights in heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chooses to give birth to us by giving us his true word. So every good and perfect thing comes from God. So God is good, and all that is good comes from God. And he's speaking to us all the time. So God has spoken to man throughout history. And it's counted to them as, a, as, as being great men of faith who listen and obey God. All right? So your, your measure of maturity, your measure of, of wisdom is how well you listen to God and then how well you obey what you hear from God. And that has been true throughout the history of the Word of God. So in Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, it says, Faith is the confidence that, we, that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through the faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. Faith is the confidence to trust and to obey the one that you have faith in. Do you have faith in God today? Do you have enough confidence to live according to what he's saying to you? In Hebrews 11.3, it says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command. Okay? that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Now let me throw this in for free. When we stop trusting and obeying in God, the God that created the universe and started trusting in ourselves and others, then what we have is called chaos. God, who put this thing together, is the master of order. Without him is disorder. And remember, I've, I've said this before when I preach, Satan is the author of the prefix D-I-S. So if you want order again, you just need to seek the voice of God and obey it in your life. Hebrews eleven seven, 7, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat and saved his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. God spoke to Noah and said, go build a huge boat in the desert and fill it with seven of all clean animals and two of all unclean animals. I probably would have said, anything else while you're at it? You want to, you know, you want a hot fudge Sunday? I mean, it'd be like, what? It was absurd. But Noah, upon hearing from God, put all his trust in God, and even more importantly, he obeyed him, and in the midst of extreme adversity and ridicule, he saved his family, which is us. Thank you, Noah, for your obedience 
Thank you for your trust in God. And hearing a voice, not of this world, tell you to build a ship in a desert for a rain that had never come to save us. And that's why it's credited to him as a great man of faith because he trusted God and he obeyed God. He heard his voice, Hebrew 11, 8 through 10. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed what God called him when he had called him to leave his home and go to another land and God had given him, it was going to give him an inheritance, but he didn't even tell him where he was going. And even when he reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Why did Abraham have so much trust? Because God spoke to him. In Hebrews eleven twenty two. 22, it was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them, take my bones with you when you leave. Why did Joseph not waver from the truth of God? Because God spoke to him. He spoke to him in a dream, and then he continued to speak to him and give him instructions. And because Joseph lived a life knowing the voice of God, obeying the voice of God, even though he didn't see the promise of God before he died, he never doubted it. And so it was credited to him by faith. Are you getting the picture of, of Hebrews chapter 11? In verses 24 through 30 in chapter 11, it says, It was by faith Moses... When he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of the enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead at the great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. Think, I mean, I mean I, you think about some of this from the human standpoint. I heard a voice of somebody not human tell us we need to go find a lamb, perfect, kill it. Put the blood on a road post and the angel of death will pass over. No, everyone go do it. The faith the nation of Israel had to have at that moment to walk in that obedience, but because of their obedience, they were set free. So God spoke to Adam and Eve. God spoke to each one of these heroes of faith, and they're heroes of faith because they listened to God, they trusted, and they obeyed. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, hmm, the wheels fell off and they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho seven times in one day. They did it for seven days and on the seventh day, seven times. And then God said, shout. And walls that some believe were nine foot thick, they fell because they obeyed God. In Hebrews 11, 32 through 35, how much more do I need to say, the scripture says. It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all of the prophets. By faith, these men overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of a sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became strong in battle, and they put whole armies to flight because they heard from God, and they trusted and obeyed him. You know, one of my favorites, and I was just in this in my devotions this last week, is Gideon. In fact, there's many times God has given me a prophetic word as I'm making a transition, and he calls me to go into Gideon, and he says, hey, mighty man of valor, and I get it said, the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, and this is Judges 6, 11 through 14, which belonged to uh, Joash of the clan of um, Abiezer. Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide <laughs> the grain from the Midianites. So he's hiding in a wine press. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and he says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir Gideon replies, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening to us? And where are all the miracles the ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. So I would say initially he's not doing the whole faith thing very well. 
But I, I'm going to just skip through some verses and not give you the whole story. I would tell you to go there. It's a great story. So then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. And verses 3 through 8, Therefore tell your people, whoever is timid. So he gathers this great army. First he tears down the uh, idol to, to Baal and, and the Asherah pole. And uh, when they come after him to kill him to say who would do that, he says, Well, if, Baal's, if he's a real God, tell him to come kill me. Um, he's getting the faith thing pretty quick, right? It didn't take long for him to realize that the God of Israel that they were crying out to heard, and he chose to speak to him. So it didn't matter if he came from the least of the tribes, and he was the least of the least of the tribes. God spoke to him, and so he needed to trust and obey, and he began to do so. So he commanded the army come together, all right? But then God says to this, he says over... um, 32,000 soldiers. So can you imagine going from hiding in a wine press to lead an army of 32,000? He's feeling pretty good now. So God says to him, he says, I'll tell you what, now tell those who are scared to go home. 22,000 go home. Well, at least went 10,000 who were willing to fight. But then the Lord said to Gideon, well then, ah, there's still too many. If we leave it at that, they're going to think they did it, not me. So lead them to the spring, and here's the deal. If they sit down and stick their face in the water and they're not paying attention around them, then send them home. But those that kneel down and keep, you know, their weapon in one hand and they lap up with the other, keep them. And that, what did that do? It took them from 32,000 to 10,000 down to 300. What did Gideon say? You know what? You have such a great plan, but it's beyond my imagination. I think maybe you should choose somebody else. No, he continued to obey. So only 300 men drank that way. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you. Now, how many men were they up against? I know this. It was at least 135,000. And God said, let's do that with 300. Do you trust me? Do you believe me? So Gideon collected the provisions, the ram horns, and the other warriors, and he sent them home. But he kept the 300 with him. And in 16 and 22, he divided the 300 men into three groups of 100. He gave them ram horn, a ram horn, a clay pot, and a torch. <laughs> Sam, one of the 300. And I've seen my army go from 32,000 32, to 10,000 to 300. And I see that army of 135,000 and then some. And then he gives us a clay pot, a torch, and a trumpet. I'm not going to battle if I don't trust that that word came from God and trust the God that gave the word. Amen? Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do what I do. As soon as I and those uh, who are with me blow my horns, uh, blow your horn too, all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord uh, and for Gideon. And it was just after midnight at the changing of the guards and Gideon and the hundred men that were with them reached the edge of the Midian camp. And suddenly they blew the ram's horns, they broke the clay pot, they lifted up their torch, and the three groups blew their horns, and they broke their jaw, their, their, yeah, and they all shouted for the sword of the Lord and for Gideon. Every, each and every man stood at his position around the camp and watched all the Midianites rushing around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their trumpet, their, their, their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled. There were at least 135 in the Midianites' camp. 135,000. It says 300 men with clay pots, torches, and trumpets defeated them. Why? Because Gideon heard from God, he trusted him, and he obeyed him. Have I established enough precedence in the word of God that God speaks to his people, and if they obey, they'll have victory? Because this is important. Our entire church foundation is about hearing from God in today's world, just like people have throughout time. But it doesn't matter if you hear from God if you don't trust him and obey. What good is an instruction from your GPS if you won't turn where it says to turn? You're still going to end up fighting with your spouse at a gas station somewhere. God spoke through Jesus on the earth specifically for three and a half years And he created a following that lasted forever. Many believers were healed. How many? John 21, 24 through 25 says this. This disciple, John, the one who's writing this, 
who testifies of these events and has recorded them here, we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did so many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. That was his response to how many miracles, how many things that God did. All Jesus had to do is speak, and at the hearing of his voice, what? Leprosy fell off. The deaf hear, the blind saw, the lame walked, all right? The demon-possessed were set free, all in hearing God's voice through his son Jesus on the earth. But then Jesus left this earth, but not without some instructions. In Acts 1, 4 and 5, he says, Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promised. As I told you before, John baptized you with water, but just in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses telling people about me everywhere, Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In Acts 2, 1 through 4, that day occurs, about 120 in the upper room, and on that Pentecost day, all the believers meeting together in one place, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty windstorm. It filled the house where they were sitting, and then what looked like flames and tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking out of the languages the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. In Acts 2, 14 and 18, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 of the apostles, and he shouted to the crowd, listen carefully. And I'm going to skip my favorite part and just go to what he said. What you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel in the last days. And I just want to tell you today, if the last days, if it was the last days in the first century, do you think it's the last days in the 21st century? And God says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon, my, uh, upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. Even on your servants, men and women alike, they will prophesy. This brings us to <laughs> one of my favorite numbers, seven. It's God's favorite number, too. One of his. Some of you are saying, but what does this still have to do with God speaking today? That's what that was. When Peter stepped forward, he said, what Joel prophesied, the prophet prophesied hundreds of years ago, that is this. And he is still speaking. And we are still in the last days. And the church is still commanded to listen to the voice of God and trust and obey it. That's what brings us to number seven. First, he wisely left us the written chronicle of him speaking to his children called the Word of God, the Bible. It is still the foundation of us hearing from God. If you hear somebody say that God said this and it doesn't sound familiar to you and it doesn't sound like God, you have the Bible to open up and to look to see if it verifies. You know, it's your, it's your fact checker. And let me tell you, there's a lot of fact checkers out there that aren't facts. There's a lot of fact checkers that are based on other people's truths that aren't the truth. There's only one the truth. It's the absolute truth of Jesus and it's the word of God. So how do you know it's God? How do you know God is speaking to you? Check your facts with the fact. Jack. There we go. He's the truth. And it's there. And if it doesn't line up, that's okay. You just say thank you. Appreciate your... Appreciate what you're trying to do there. Appreciate your input. All right? So he gives us the word of God, but he also speaks to us. All right? He speaks to us in his presence All right, you know there's that sense of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it said the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke the truth. And Jesus said, now I must go so the promise of God can come, which is the Holy Spirit, which came into them. So they have the very person of God in their spirit speaking to their mind. We just have to listen. Shut out the white noise. And then we have to trust. Well, how do I know it's God? Hey, does it line up with the Word of God? But then God gave us prophecy. He poured it out. In the Old Testament, there were prophets. You know, in their day, if a prophet messed up, guess what happened? They got stoned to death. In the New Testament, we are not to judge the prophet. We're to judge the prophecy, right? How do we do that? What has changed? We have the Holy Spirit that came upon them in us. And so you ask the Spirit. You go to the Word of God, and you're like, is this God's Word for my day? Now, if somebody comes to you with a prophecy, and he tells you to do something that doesn't line, with, doesn't line up with anything else that God has ever told you, and you don't fact check by going to God, it's not God's mistake. It's, got no, it's not God's problem. 
And, and we've had, you know, that happens. But in 1 Corinthians 14, it says this, let love be your highest goal. But you should all desire the special abilities the Spirit gives you, especially to prophesy. Prophecy is your ability to hear directly from God for yourself and for others. Did you hear that? Prophecy is your ability to hear directly from God. Now, it can, there's words of wisdom that God gives you. There's words of knowledge. How do you know they're from God? Because, you know, even today in troubleshooting issues around this platform, all right, the Holy Spirit would tell me how to fix the problem. Now, I can, you know, I can take credit for it. I just don't have one lick of electronics background. I don't No, the Holy Spirit just says this. Is it. And does he care about little things? You bet he does. I was trying to get those can lights to work on that balcony for, I don't know what, two months? And I'm moving chairs around last night at 9.30 at night, and I kind of just kind of whined to God a little bit. You know, it wasn't new wine. It definitely wasn't new wine. And I'm just like, you know, God, I know I have to go up there every Sunday with a ladder, and now we're going to have people sitting up there. And, and back there in the corner, up against the wall, on the floor, these cords are just nicely stapled together. But there was an XLR end, and it was just a little, just, just you, you had to go real close. And I didn't think of it. I mean, I just whined to God. I mean, I just, it's like, hey, Dad, how come you don't fix it? You know what I mean? I mean, I wouldn't use those words, but that's really what, and he knows your heart. And so I'm, I'm looking at the light, and he just turns me around, and it's like, he just kind of grabs me by the nose, and he brings me over there, and I look real close to the XLR connection, and I reach down, click. This morning I hit the button, the lights come on. God cares. He's speaking to you. You just have to listen, even about the little things. Our time is gone. We're going to come back to this because it's so important as a foundation to your life. God is speaking to you all the time. You just have to listen, right? So I'm trying to skip through here quick. He, he, God did and still does want communication with his family. He never stops speaking. Somewhere in it, we just stop listening. John 10, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Our job as sheep is to learn the voice of the shepherd. That's, that's our number one priority. And we need to retune our ears and our hearts to the voice of God again. You see, Jesus did his part. He came. He gave his life for sin. Going back to your original sin, Adam and Eve, he came. He wiped that out. He reconnected us. He, he found the cord that was broken with Adam and Eve. He found that XLR cord that looked like it was together, but it wasn't, and we couldn't communicate with God because God can't, he can't be in the same place as sin. And so Jesus came, and he canceled the debt of sin with his own body, and he reconnected us to God. And the light came on. Now we just have to walk in it. For this, we must do our part. We must hear his voice and learn to hear his voice as he speaks to us through his word, the Bible which is illuminated to us through the Holy Spirit. It's our lens. He's our interpreter. We have to learn his voice through prayer, communication with him, remembering 80% of communication is listening. We have to learn to hear from him directly through prophecy. We have to, through watching, looking for him in our dreams, looking for him in our heart, the feelings that he, 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 he moves us and compels us. God is speaking all the time. We just have to listen today. If you'd like to hear his voice, and maybe you've never, ever asked Jesus, the Son of God, into your heart before, please, take this moment. This is the appointed time. We must, like Adam and Eve, realize that we made decisions counter to God, and we have to repent for them and choose this day to turn to the Master, the Creator, the Clockmaker, <laughs> the one who designed you, and go to him and ask his son into your life. When you do, you will feel the peace of the presence of God and that's part of how he communicates to you. It's unmistakable and it will lead you down the path of knowing God, the God of the universe, as your personal father in a real way, in a tangible way like none other. He created you. He has an awesome plan for your life and as you learn to listen, he'll lead you in that plan. For the rest of us, who know Jesus is our Lord and Savior, he's calling, on, he's calling your number too. Thank you for having your ringers off, but your phone might be on vibrate. Just pay attention. God is calling you too. He's calling you closer. He needs us to listen to what he has to say about what's going on in our world today. They don't need our opinion. 
They need the truth from the Father. And they get it from you listening to him, trusting and obeying and walking in the words that he has for you. Now, he's probably not going to ask you to make a great ship in the middle of the wilderness. But he is asking you to bring his love into your world. You just have to pick up the phone and listen. Not somebody else's perception of the truth, but hearing directly from the truth. Maybe you are struggling hearing in the midst of all the noise. Well, there are going to be people here waiting to pray for you in a moment, pray you through to peace. If you're watching or listening and you're at home or on the road today, please share your prayer needs with us so that we can pray with you and leave and, and then leave your contact information with us, if you would, please, because we want to continue to help you along your journey of hearing the voice of God. God speaks to us in these painful and confusing times. He speaks to us clearly so that we can walk in his way. And his way is righteous. His way is everlasting. His way brings us into what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. And if there's anything our nation needs right now, if there's anything this world needs right now, is its righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Stand with me and let's pray. If you're on the prayer team, I'd ask you to make your way up here. There are X's so that you are spaced out enough in uh, applying with CDC guidelines. But these people are anointed to pray with you, which is along the Holy Spirit guidelines. And so we're going to put the two together and watch God move. Amen. So pick your X, any X. If you want to pray in a moment, um, I'm going to just pray a blessing and a benediction upon all of you. If you want prayer, if you'd come down along that line, there's X marks the spot for you too. And as you walk up there, if that's you and you stand there, I guarantee you that God will let you know your name is on that spot because he chose today to talk to you in a very specific way. If you're at home today and you're crying out to him for the first time, I guarantee you God will speak to you because he put this whole thing in order, all right? He put it all in motion. He created it all so that he could have communion with you, that this moment, this very moment could happen. So let's just pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that anybody and everybody who calls on his name can be saved. Lord, Jesus put in motion a plan with purpose that he gave a sacrifice. He gave his life. He took all the pain and agony of division, of, of persecution, all the agony of racism, all the agony of hatred, jealousy, envy, fear. He took it all on him so that we could be one. And he's going to return. And he's returning for one generation. And that's not a generation of a certain age. That is a generation where they all come as one. The oneness that he called us to, the oneness that he demonstrates with his Father and his Spirit, the oneness that he prayed over us in John chapter 17. But we must listen and trust and obey and walk in his way. So God, pour out your spirit on everyone who's listening. Everyone who calls on your name, God, answer in clarity, I pray. And we thank you, God, that we have a God that created us to win. And when we accept him, we join his family and his family's victory was sealed on the cross. So we live victory to victory as we follow your word, your voice, as it speaks to our heart in clarity. Bless everyone. And Lord, may they walk out of here ambassadors of peace. Lord, I pray you'd pour peace upon their home, peace in their cars today as they drive home. Lord, peace in their workplace. Lord, peace in this state and peace in this city and peace in this nation, God. I thank you for the people and the believers all over the world that are praying with us. And as we're seeing that white figure, <laughs> in the spiritual battle, the remnant of the church rising up and growing and tearing down the strongholds of hatred, tearing down the strongholds of fear and ushering in a generation of peacemakers, ushering in the peace of the presence of God. We give you glory for that, God, and we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of meeting together again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bless you guys. It's good to have you back. Bring some friends next Sunday. Amen.
If you need prayer, the prayer team is here for you. Please come around to this side. We do ask you, as we ask you to come in the side door, they want a flow of traffic. Now you can please leave through the front door. Panera will be outside on the table for anyone who wants to take some of that with you. I tell you to go pick up your kids, but you already have them. Bless you.